for schools. All right. I'm going ahead and hit record. Let's get it. Welcome in to Patriot Sports, part of the Six Pack Coverage Network. Well done in here with Nick Trucial and Seth Coggin. Guys, we've got a lot to talk about today. A lot of drama went on this past weekend, but first we'll kick it off talking a little bit about the PGA Championship. Oh, yeah, baby. Justin Thomas comes away with the win. But first, I, I noticed interesting fact I found out. My dad was uh, telling me this, and I guess he found it out on the broadcast. Every time, every leader after 54 holes at the PGA Championship has won the tournament until this year. Really? Yes. That's almost that the crazy. first time ever that wow. the leader after. Ever. No way. No way it's been ever. Yeah, dude. Look it up. All right. Someone look it up. Someone go stat an early an early stat. Yeah, stat that. We'll have to find it out because if we don't, we'll have to blame. I'll, I'll blame my dad on it. He's the one who told me. I assume he. I mean, he was watching the whole thing. Well, uh, I'll I'll look it up here as we're going. But uh, why don't okay, we? Cool. Will you want to? Anyway, check yeah. That off? So you had Pereira coming in, leading long into the weekend. Well, leading after the third round and. Uh, Obviously, he was holding on pretty much the whole final round. Zalatoris was up there. JT got hot at the end. And then, oh, Pereira, 18th hole. Absolute just disaster. Those are like career ending. Like, kind yeah, of, I kind mean, of that, it was right bad. You could tell. So, first of all, I don't even know why he went driver on the last hole. Like, just hit something. Like, I'm pretty sure Zalatoris was hitting a three wood the whole time. Yeah. Every time he played 18. Just hit one down the middle like you just got to play for par on this hole you know yeah there's no reason to he was to me it looked like the nerves kind of got to him if you saw that replay of that first drive it looked super funky like i don't know what happened yeah well they didn't even the the tracker didn't even follow it like it was just terrible when he like snapped or something on his follow-through it was weird seeing that that was a true mental block right there like he got half he got over the ball and was so like I don't know you know obviously I wasn't in his head but it from what it felt like from when I've seen myself play like maybe a nervous or not I don't really play nervous because I don't play for anything typically but still when I need you know just a mental just your your muscle memory you know from those pros have taken so many shots like they know how to swing a golf club like so fluidly so perfect obviously he's leading the PGA championship 71 holes in like he's played 71 holes against the heart best golfers in the world. And he's leading like he's playing best. And then all of a sudden you get to that very last hole. It's right there in front of you. It's like, all I got to do is par this hole and I probably win the, the championship. Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden your swing, just hands probably feel like they weigh 800 pounds and you're just breathing is all messed up. Can't regulate it. You're standing over that ball with millions of people watching you with the pressure and he just snapped like he literally just snapped um and oh to block something off like that with with that high stakes is just unreal it's nothing but pressure like he hadn't hit that bad of a drive all tournament yeah and then you do it on the 72nd hole that's not a coincidence like that is just (laughs) cracking under pressure and hopefully he bounces back from it and like that doesn't define him um you know long term but horrible horrible look there um uh, which led to an awesome playoff um super just entertaining three hole playoff um i like the three hole playoff format it gives you it's quick and concise but it also gives you a little bit more than like a sudden death um kind of just one off hole i don't know what do you guys think about that yeah i mean i like the the three hole playoff um and I mean, it, well, like we were talking about before we started recording, it was just amazing to see how locked in JT was too. Cause, and I think it kind of gives, gives the guys the opportunity to really show how locked in they are. This isn't okay. It's not just one hole, whoever gets hot right here. It's who, who can really just keep things rolling and uh, keep the nerves down. So I, I like the three hole uh, playoff format. It was, yeah, uh, no, it was I like fun it to watch. Yeah. It gives you kind of a, I don't know. Cause one hole, it, give, it just gives you a chance. Like, if something crazy happens on one hole, like, you, there's kind of no excuses at that point. Like, you got to play kind of consistent golf. Also, just real quick, I'm finding absolutely nothing about that stat. I <laughs> yeah, I was trying game. to, I was trying to search well, it everywhere. But see, I the reason I thought maybe not is because didn't Tiger lose a 54 hole lead once at the PGA? 
Like that, maybe the only time he's ever lost a 54 hole lead. I think it was at the, I think it was like, I can't remember who I, that's been a while. My memory gets fuzzy. It's um, very possible, but I did question it when I first heard it, but I was like, Hey, you've been, you've been watching the tournament all week. I assume you've been listening to the fact factoids, but no, not this one, not riding with it anyway. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, JT also just absolutely caught fire the final day. The last couple of holes went off. Zalatoris, I mean, had a really good chance too. Like, I mean, yeah, he if did. He, he didn't really play well uh, on Sunday. Yeah, but it was like, well, he missed a couple of putts, and that's what I'm yeah. saying. Like, he missed a putt that was he missed a couple a of knee like, knocker basically, yeah. like a four footer. It's like you go back to it, it's like, dang, that's a he wins this thing if he doesn't miss those couple of putts because in the moment you're thinking oh he's down right now it's you know he just needs to get back to the lead or whatever and then he gets back to tying jt but i mean you could have had the whole thing won if you just made a couple putts yeah and jt a- had to scratch and claw his way back uh from what was he even coming in uh to day three or coming into sunday like that was uh pretty yeah, crazy. sounds right. I know he yeah, shot, yeah, he five, shot like five under. I think the anytime last day. you go five under on a Sunday, I mean, you might you might put your play yourself into position. Um, it. I want to go back to Zal Torres's putting. Like, has anyone that uses that belly putter? Like, is it, are they ever good putters? Like, why do people? Why do Didn't people? Adam use Scott that? use it. Yeah, and he yeah, but that was always his deal that he struggled with was putting. Like it's, it's like a almost like a security blanket that that actually doesn't really even make you better. Like, I don't know, maybe it does make you a hair more consistent. Maybe those guys just, I don't know. It's always been kind of lame to me to use the belly putter. Uh, just kind of, just kind of man up and use the yeah. regular putter. Like people have I been putting with, with forever. People have made a lot of putts and putted really well with the regular putter. Like, I don't know. I mean, I know they were kind of moving to, uh, they may even banned or, kind of moved away from the one you truly anchored on your body he may not i don't know i'd have to go back and truly look at his i just know he uses that taller putter um which has always just been odd to me like and he still struggles like obviously that is kind of where his mental we talked about the mental game like he almost had those yips a little bit on the um kind of those short putts he you saw the video that up close video of his putter and it's like not a fluid back and forth at all like he moves it like sideways back it, anyway, just an odd kind of, and like you said, well, like in a tournament like that, like one four foot missed putt on like hole 13 on a That's Sunday. It. Yeah. And he wins, he wins the tournament. Uh, now, you know, you never know how things play out, but, but he still put himself in position to be in a, <laughs> in the final, um, final playoff um, and had a chance to win. He played fine in the, in the, uh, yeah. JT just, just played a little more dialed in Yeah, to come out cold and come out birdie birdie and just put the gas on when they both birdied the first hole that was lit though. It was like, Oh shoot. Like, You're like here we go. Like, this is going to be crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. JT was just solid. He was one of those dudes that man, when he does start kind of striping it and playing well, like he is capable of anything. He can be more dialed in than just about anybody. He does definitely doesn't let really the well. nerves get to him. No, nah, like, yeah, he, gets, yeah. he gets in the zone. And that's what that, – that is truly the barrier you see between guys who have won a major championship and guys who haven't. Like, that pressure – you can be the one of the best golfers out there and you've played four solid rounds, but that pressure uh, that comes with finishing a major and winning it and, and not just kind of being there, not just being the top ten guy, not being the top five guy, but winning a major – is a threshold above most people won't ever do it. Most professional golfers, even if they play 10, 15, 20 years on tour, probably will never be a major champion. Um, so to kind of, because most of the time you're not going to run away with a major, you know, you're not going to win by three, four five strokes, especially unless you're like Tiger Woods or, you know, some of these guys that can truly just put it out there and just run away from everybody. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be tight coming down at the end. And you're going to have to make some very, very, very big pressure shots with a lot of eyes on you because a lot of these guys like Pereira like on Thursday. Yeah. I mean, you know, people are out there watching him and, you know, people, but, but there's not a, many uh, eyeballs on no, him. No, nobody was watching. But then it gets Nito to Pereira. Sunday at 18 yeah. and you're the last group on the course and it's for the championship. And suddenly it goes from, you know, he's got a couple people watching him to suddenly millions of eyeballs. And you saw what happened. And I can't like I can't hate on the guy like 
what's happening to me in that situation, I'm probably, I'm not going to be in that situation. <laughs> let's be honest. Like I wouldn't be good enough at golf. So I would hope if I was good enough at golf to be in that situation, maybe I could overcome it. But uh, my palms would be pretty sweaty. Yeah. My palms get sweaty at top golf, just trying to hit shots. Maybe that's more so like the grips on those top golf clubs are yeah, they're crappy. the slickest thing. I was just at top golf this past weekend. So I'm, I'm always thinking I'm going to throw one of those clubs. Yeah, there was somebody threw a club out into the like uh, range while I was yeah, there. I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often. Yeah, it, it's. Ridiculous. I bet it does happen more often. Than it you probably think. does, and especially when uh, you get a crew of people who's had about four or five pitchers, yeah. uh, knocking back. I mean, that They're club swinging for uh, the gets a little bit slippery. Too. Yeah, it gets yeah. slick, man. I got to remember to bring my golf glove. Like I know that's kind of a, a hardo move to like, but it's like, nah. If I'm gonna swing the club, like I'm. I want a good grip. <laughs> I don't want the blister in the in the ring finger either. That's yeah. the other thing. I mean, that's why I wear the glove. But said it's funny you say that too about Pereira because, yeah, I think that's totally right. And I think you see that pressure too with a lot of guys who can never get over the major hump, like these guys who are really good but never win a major. Like it's always in the back of their head, and I think that plays a lot into it. And then you have some guys who come out of nowhere and win a random major because they're kind of playing like, they they get to the final day and they're playing like with house money in their mind, you know, like they're never going to, they're thinking, I, I can't even believe I'm in this situation. Like I'm just going to enjoy it. And then they kind of play with more free thinking, free mind, and it ends up working in their favor. Yeah. yeah. And it's it pretty be crazy. A... Cause I mean, at the, when you're getting to those last couple of holes on Sunday, a couple of those putts, like each one of those putts will be 250 grand. Like it's, you got to kind of think about think it about from... that a lot. You, you like, got to think about it. Oh yeah. Especially like Mito Pereira, a guy who maybe hasn't, uh, doesn't have the bankroll that Justin Thomas or somebody who's won a major before uh, has, I mean, even uh, the difference between second, third, fourth, fifth is very, yeah. very big. He so. did. He, what did he cost himself on that? Okay. Do that last hole? Pure purse. Like not even you, your endorsement, like winning a major means your endorsements goes yeah. up. Your everything, everything skyrockets. But on truly just purse, the he probably lost six hundred k in that what like he that. last hole. He finished third, I guess, or tied for third. No, yeah, I think it was a fifteen probably, million dollar pool. I think he probably um, so, lost like four hundred grand. Probably. So Justin Thomas made two point seven million, um, and then Cameron Young and Mito Pereira uh, made eight hundred seventy thousand each. Oh, really? So That's he what, lost like one point four mil. I thought the winner got like one point something. No, he got 2.7. That's a Dang. big purse, dude. Purses now in golf are insane. Well, if you make the cut, you make like 30 grand. Yeah. So there you yeah. Go. <laughs> it's like the top, usually the top 20 or 30 are still making like six digits. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the last. Which honestly, you need to when you think about everything that goes into like travel and paying like how many people you have to pay in golf too, like your coaches and everything yeah so the first well, one through 28 made over 100 grand nice not a bad weekend not a bad weekend at all in tulsa oklahoma it was super close to me i thought about kind of swinging over there but that would have been cool yeah it was uh, sick. it was unfortunate to see tiger uh have to withdraw i mean he obviously yeah, wasn't was gonna make any noise but you could tell dude. he was hurt he had a good uh pretty he had a good day too he had yeah, a good day too to make he made the cut man he made the cutter to yeah. major that's sick yeah yeah so he's what two for two and made cuts after yeah. almost yeah. losing uh losing a leg that's champion. pretty amazing champion man and what what was it uh was it the PGA championship in 08 or 09 when uh, he had that torn ACL and broken knee and all that, that was stuff? the U S open in 08. Was it? Okay. Was so it was yeah. It was the U S open. That's what it was. That was um, so awesome where he had the 18 hole playoff. Yeah. And he was literally like wincing after every shot, just dying out there. But tiger, I mean, his mental, I, his mental ability might be better than anyone we've ever seen in golf. Yeah. The mental toughness. It's gotta be up there. Oh, it, in golf? Yeah. No one – that's the thing, the thing about Tiger that makes him so di- – I think he's not unlike all athletes ever, but I think he did bring a new attitude to golf. Like a He brought true, in the like, Jordan. He had that killer instinct of, yeah. that not a ton of golfers – even like great golfers 
were just kind of great golfers. Yeah, yeah they might like they, Arnie like, and Jack. I mean, Nicholas, and like, it's hard for me to say that I was not competing. They were obviously great competitors, but I'm talking like that next level of drive, driven athlete where it's just like not accepting anything. Yeah, other than all I like, want to do is win, and yeah, all I, I will know do how to anything do. Yeah. it takes. Yeah, yeah, and so I think Tiger was kind of the first, and really still to this day, only kind of just true go mamba mentality kind of yeah. esque like this guy is just so locked in on winning at any cost that it's hard to it's hard to compete like that it's hard to live like that because it's almost not a real per- like tiger is yeah. almost not a real person well i mean you look at those so singularly Kobe's focused and, uh, on winning michael golf. jordan's and uh just the unconscious ability to kind of turn into a new animal new beast when the most pressure is on you is crazy yeah. I mean, usually it's yeah. the complete opposite, but uh, for some that's reason, why you guys... gotta, that's why you work that hard. It's like you, you literally, I work so hard all of this time so that when the pressure is on, I rise above it. Like, I don't, I know that my, my work is good. My work is solid. Like my foundation that I'm about to hit this shot on is, is a one, like I've worked harder than you. So now the lights are bright and we'll see who performs and tiger obviously won quite a few more times than he lost and that's what those kind of competitors bring like literally stalking around the golf course with tiger for the for 18 holes on a sunday like you think many people have stood to that test like not many golfers have like walked step for step with him gone shot for shot with him to try to and beat him Uh, yeah and the crowd it just goes so crazy for tiger and i mean every time he's doing well america is happy so it kind of i think even has to get into some of those golfers heads like the crowd, all they care about is Tiger and they want to see Tiger win and everybody is behind him. So I think that can kind of even <laughs> push you a little bit further, piss you off a little bit, throw you off your game uh, a little bit. And it's just, just makes Tiger that much more unique. Well, I think those younger guys definitely get starstruck. Like those, oh, the, yeah, some of the older guys that have been playing they with probably them since don't. Yeah. the early 2000s or something, they're used to it and they love that he's playing and all that. But the younger guys, I feel like are like, holy crap, like, Tiger Woods is playing in this, <laughs> you know, like a total, it's, it's a total like living legend moment kind of thing. Um, let's go ahead and hop into kind of the biggest drama over, I guess it started kind of midweek last week, maybe, and then carried over into the weekend, but obviously all the drama with Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher, I'm going to just kind of open it up real quick and then let y'all have at it. So this all kind of started, I believe with the video of Saban surfacing, basically saying, hey, we at Bama had the number two recruiting class. A&M was number one. A&M paid every single player on their team. We didn't pay anybody. LMAO, that is ridiculous, first of all. Anyway, then, then Jimbo comes back, holds a press conference. There's so many things to dive into about this because I can see both sides looking like making sense and both sides looking like total jackasses. Jimbo comes back with a press conference and just goes on a rant, basically de- trying to defend a and but also going at Saban, getting pissed off. You have players coming in, talking about getting paid, all this, so much to go into. I'll give my opinion on it at first. At first, I was on Jimbo's side because I thought what Saban said was completely asinine, saying that trying to say that he doesn't pay any players is hilarious. Yeah. Then Jimbo comes back, and I'm kind of thinking, dude, why? Like, why? Why are we doing this? You're getting way too upset about this. You're kind of whining. I get you're defending yourself, but what? Like, what was the point of this? Because I mean, he's kind of right. And I, my thought process was, you know, Saban. We'll talk about this too. Saban apparently tried to call Jimbo. Jimbo didn't answer. I think to Saban, he really. Like, he said that, and yeah, it sounds stupid, but I really don't think he cares as much about the whole situation. I no. think he is a little upset with the way college football recruiting is about to move. Exactly. But at the same time, I don't think he really has any bad blood towards Jimbo, and we talked about this earlier. I think Jimbo does have a total kind of little man complex towards Saban because he is one of – he's the only – he was the first assistant to beat Saban, obviously – and he does have a national championship. He's probably one of Saban's more successful yeah. assistants, obviously. 
but there is kind of a, yeah, it's crucial. You said it to me kind of like a, fu- he, like Saban's his dad, basically. And yeah. He, daddy. The, the, the stepdad that daddy uh, Saban. Off. But yeah, I'll let y'all, you take it wherever you want to go with it. I'm interested to hear what y'all have to say. So take it I off. mean, take it I'm reading through this uh, Sports Illustrated article that was about uh, seven hours ago. So this has some pretty up-to-date information. Um, Jimbo Fisher still has not talked to Nick Saban and he says, we're done like completely done uh that was quoted we're done dude uh, gotta go to aggie's gotta go t- for, before we get any further aggie's gotta go to tuscaloosa next yeah, year like, I, I, think I would just make it a point to rash. not to not absolutely you're coming at nick saban and you gotta go to alabama you know do you know how hard those people ride for nick saban you are it, it is gone. literally oh my gosh you are going into the den of wolves you, you will not – that will be – it will be dangerous for Texas A&M to go to Alabama next year, not only on the field, but literally off it. Like, I could – these fans are crazy. Remember Harvey Updike poisoning trees? Yeah. Like, poisoning trees. Like, famous Oh, I've been to trees. T-Town for a uh, third Saturday in October, and those fans are nasty. Oh, and nasty. they are going to be vicious. They do not care it about will be opposing fans vicious. whatsoever. I would and not they, go as an opposing fan. Like, the team's got to go. I'm serious. Like if I was an a and fan, I would stay away because it literally, most of the people will probably, most people are normal. Like there'll be but like, there's crazy. Oh, boo. Like screw you guys. Like that's fine. You know, that's part of the game, but then yeah, there will be crazy bit. people like who will jump you ready just because to you're wearing jump the wrong you. colors. Yeah. Yes. Because you're wearing Aggie maroon. Oh man. Hold up. I want to, I want to go through a little bit. I want to go through a little bit of Jimbo's quote. Context matters a lot here. I think too. Context might be the biggest thing here. Yes. Saban's comments came at a big donor and booster event. Very limited media availability. These are the type of people in the room that would be paying for NIL deals and stuff of the sort. So like, it's almost like the, firing them up to say, hey, exactly. like, AM is doing all this stuff. You guys, we need to start doing like, this We got to kind of roll. Like if this is how the game's going to be played, we got to play it at a higher level. And it's it's truly when I heard Saban's comments, yes, he's kind of griping about the situation as a whole, but almost he's putting respect on Tex A&M's name. He's literally pointing to them and say, look, they did in, the best where, job. when these were the rules for everybody, they did the best job. They were number one. They knocked us off like they did better than us. It's and a yeah, little bit used, of a backhanded compliment. It's a, it is. It is. And it's kind of like you had to do this. But see, I'm saying AM should have taken it as like just take it for what it is, as like, hey, he's literally saying we did it better. We beat Nick yeah. Saban. Like he, Saban he's only mad at himself. us. He's singling out AM because we did it better than him. Like for once, we beat Saban and he's and we beat him on the field too, and then beat him in recruiting. Like he's targeting us. That's big deal. Like that is that's like we're top in Saban's mind. That means. That's a good sign for our football pro. Like that is a great yeah, thing. I think like that is a compliment. That, scenario. that is a that is a huge com- if if Nick Saban was pissed about Arkansas's recruiting tactics, you know how happy I'd be? I would be I would be pumped. I would be ecstatic. Yeah, I'd be Jimbo going crazy. Just Jimbo just does the most aggy beta thing ever. This is all like it just fits so well into what into Texas A&M agginess. Like this is just what they do. There, someone's kind of like. I'm, I'm going into the Jimbo quote. I got I got some of it pulled up because it's he takes it even so so much further than Saban didn't mention anything about the kids. He didn't mention anything about the families. He just said Texas A and M. Like he literally just said, as a school, Texas A and M. You know, got all their players. They paid all their players with nil nil deals, which is legal. Like he never really accused them of cheating. Yeah, he, he just said specifically like, said. He, he I obviously never said anything his comments about it before he. Yeah, he was he he does not like the NIL like Yeah, that's what he specifically awesome. said. It's the system. It's not yeah. nobody's doing anything illegal. I just hate the system. Which makes sense. When you're the current king, why would you want the system to change? Especially like, king of recruiting. Yeah. Okay, so here here we go here. It's a shame that we have to do this. It's really <laughs> that despicable that we have to. Oh, this meeting that I called yeah, the, this press conference that I made about myself, it's really a shame that we have to, that we as a collective have to do that. It's despicable. It's despicable. That's, he says despicable about 18 billion times. 
It's despicable that somebody can say things about somebody and more importantly, 17 year old kids. You're taking shots at 17 year old kids and their families that they broke state laws that we brought bought every player on this group. We never bought anybody. No rules were broken. Nothing was done wrong. All right. It's despicable that, that a reputable head coach can come out and say this when he doesn't get his way or things don't go his way. The narcissist in him doesn't allow those things to happen. And it's ridiculous when he's not on top. Oh man. Oh boy. I, I mean, there's not calling the kettle black. Some yeah, people seriously. think they're, they're God. both narcissists. They're both <laughs> dirty, rotten scumbags that I, I don't want to win in college football. Yeah, no, they, they literally are one in the same. It, it, it's so, I mean, it's just so ironic. Jimbo Fisher calling Nick Saban a narcissist. When Nick Saban had these comments at a, at a, you know, a thing that was, you think Nick Saban wants to go meet with a bunch of donors and boosters? Like, probably not. Like, that is kind of part of the gig. Like, he does have to do that kind of stuff. You know what's narcissist behavior? To call a press conference at 10 a.m. the very next morning and say, no, I'm going to sit on stage for 10 minutes and rant about this guy. And, and he goes on to say, like, you people think he's God. And and some people in Alabama would probably think of him about as highly as God, honestly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he is kind of the czar of college football. He's uh, He has earned that title like when Nick Saban with seven championships starts talking about something you do have to pay attention like he is on the forefront one of the greatest it, I mean he knows what he's the talking greatest about coach, sure. yeah he the greatest coach of all time um anyway he goes on to say something uh something along the lines of uh, oh hold on I'm trying to think of what it because it just it just it just he the way he said despicable so many times it's just hilarious the way he, he said, said despicable multiple times and like there was yeah. a chart someone had a chart oh, was like no, he this said is no this is what he, yeah th- he said when people show you who they are just pay attention because it's who they are and he's trying to talk about nick saban but in all reality it only just points back at jimbo it's <laughs> like jimbo you're showing us exactly who you are You are this absolute beta who's so triggered by the fact that Nick Saban's concerned that you beat him, that you can't just accept the fact that you're on top for once. Kick kick your feet back and let Saban kick back and say, look, the rules were the same for everybody. The rules were the same for every single school across the country. And we used it the best to our advantage and we won. We, we beat you. We came out on top. So just sit there and kick your feet up and say, and flex that. And say, yes, we did. We threw money. We threw NIL deals like AM. We got that cash. Yeah, like, bring come it on. Play for come A&M. on, recruits. Let's we got go. it. We're going we're gonna to throw that cash around. Instead, he whines about making fun of these despicable, like Jimbo, you're so misreading. You're so caught up. And I don't know if you're self conscious or ignorant or just, or that's just your personality of being this, oh, second, yeah, like daddy issues with Nick Saban. Oh, Jimbo had a chance to actually once kind of gain some points in my mind and be like, no, screw you, Nick Saban. We did beat you. Like shout out. I can be on anyone's team. That's beating Saban. Like, yeah, respect. Like y'all did better than Saban there. Uh, you did better than Alabama, but no, he chose the exact opposite route. He chose to whine and whine and whine and made himself look as Jimbo typically does like this, just sad little greasy little slime ball of a coach who's got like the tech him showing up in like snake skin boots. And he's like a snake oil salesman back in the day, like showing up to your town saying, I've got this miracle treatment. I'm Jimbo Fisher. I really love riding horses. You think Jimbo was riding many horses before he was at Texas A&M? Like he's a poser. He's a poser. He won one national championship with, with uh, Jameis Winston. And other than that, he is severely underperformed for what he's paid. He has the exact same record in four years as Kevin Sumlin had before him. So the exact same head coach at the exact same university that got paid substantially less and got fired. He has the same exact record. Okay, Jimbo. Now you got the number one recruiting class. You better do something with it. All right. That's kind of, I'll, I'll that's, that's, that's all I got to say. Cause I can get hot. Jimbo. Well, and it's interesting. I've got a couple of things. It's interesting. You say that about someone because Hey, someone also beat Bama a couple of times or yeah, gave them a run for did. their money. Someone also had them really hot and ranked really high at times. Um, but also here's the thing. So if Jimbo either doesn't comment on this 
or does the you he could come out and say you know what nil is the thing now we are going by the book with nil as far as that goes if he says that <clears throat> and basically doesn't really comment on it or whatever what what is the entire kind of nation doing everyone is basically laughing at the saving comment saying that he never paid anyone that it ends there pretty much by yeah you're right by doing this all it does is bring more attention to what Jimbo's doing and make him kind of look more like a fool yeah. now I do want to say like Saban is kind of continuing to go with this he doesn't like the way the system's going and he does kind of continue to give these backhanded compliments everywhere he goes he did bring up I don't remember the exact quote maybe y'all can help me out he did bring up the whole Jackson State thing with Travis Hunter going yeah. there and getting paid a million and that kind of brought Dion into Dion it issued really a warning to off. Saban what's that Dion issued a warning to Saban. Did you see that? Uh, well, so what, Coach Prime came out. You know the and quotes. Can you bring that up or tell yeah, me what I'm, exactly I'm what happened? Here. Um, so Sanders responded to Saban's comments on Thursday evening, saying that he felt it should be a public instead of private conversation between the two. He, uh, Which Saban did try to call him privately. Yeah, and have some words um, before the press conference. Jimbo. Well, you're talking about Jimbo. No, Saban called Jimbo before the press conference. Yeah. Well, he, Trucial, who are you talking about? Yeah, so I'm talking about Deion Sanders. Yeah, yeah but he, um, but Deion's kind of talking about the those conversations. Yeah, he, he, oh, okay. he's weighing okay. in as well, and he says, so this was the, the quote that he said, I don't even wear a watch, and I know what time it is. They forget I know who's bringing, uh, who's been bringing the bag and dropping it off. I know this stuff. I'm not the one you want to play with when it comes to all of this stuff, <laughs> is what he said. Um, Coach Prime, baby. That's and so quote. he basically just – called Saban out and said, look, we did this the right way. You've been doing it the backhanded way this whole time. Screw you. Um, and Saban came out and apologized for some of these comments and said that he shouldn't have singled anybody out and that he's more mad at the system. And he never, he said, he specifically said, I never said anyone did anything illegal. He said, I'm pissed off at the system and the way this is playing out first. Um, so, and Deion Sanders kind of was saying that, I mean, all of a sudden, just because someone wants to come play at a HBCU, uh, that, oh, it's the only reason he's coming to play here is because he, he took the money. There's no other possible reason that he could have uh, wanted to come out and do this. And I, I think that's a, a fair point. I mean, hey, maybe you want to go play for Deion Sanders and want to be the big man on campus and do all that stuff. So I, I, I don't know if it's necessarily fair to say, okay, the only reason is to, uh, it, it, he's coming for money and that he's, uh, Deion Sanders said, Travis ain't built like that. Travis ain't chasing a dollar. Travis is chasing greatness. Um, so I think Dion at the same time chasing well. money. Yeah. He's chasing money. It, it definitely had something to do with it, but I why think are we all, why are we all of a sudden hating on chasing money? Yeah. I don't think there's anything That's what wrong it's about, with baby, get about. paid. Yeah. If I could get paid a million dollars and play college football, that would be tight. Why would I not so want sick. to do that? Yeah, why would yeah. I not do that? That would be so sick. Oh, man. I think, you know, go back to that Jimbo saying, oh, people show you who they really are. It's like, yeah, you're the one that Saban kind of reached out, tried to be a little bit of the bigger man, like tried to call you knowing that you have a personal relationship that you know everyone doesn't know yeah, about. they worked together at lsu for what he, six years he tried to reach out personally and i'm sure as an olive branch probably to say like look i overstepped you know I, you know i don't know how that conversation goes but at least like it's a sign of and he's and then jimbo shows you exactly who he is when he declines that call and says no we're done and then go and then goes off they're obviously not done because you're gonna go spend 10 minutes solo talking to the media about the same thing so, this is two grown men having like a high school breakup and one of them essentially like starts tweeting about it yeah it's yeah. not a good look for it's Jimbo. got i mean it's not a great look for saban but stupid. that's kind of saban's deal saban likes to complain about stuff that doesn't go his way jimbo yeah. was correct about that saban does love doing he that. he does love to do that 100 percent. i mean i think it's almost kind of like how belichick um was it two years ago when the titans used that um penalty kind of loophole to drain the clock against oh, the yeah, Patriots in the playoffs and Vrabel Belichick was getting game. yeah like it was so mad at Vrabel for literally doing exactly what Belichick would do all the time and do in a second um so I think it was kind of something similar to that that they 
it just kind of has that personality where he's going to get pissed off if things don't go his way. And Hey, maybe that's part of the reason why he's been so great is because he gets so personally invested and fired up and pissed off when he isn't number one at every facet of college football. Uh, so maybe that's part of the reason why Saban's been so great that it personally irks him. If he doesn't have the number one recruiting class, if they don't go number one, don't win the national championship. So I don't I know. You can look Saban... at it that way. I think Saban does feel a little bit of the power slipping away from him in a sense. Oh, I mean, you saw, you saw Georgia is up there and I mean, may not be able to fully sustain the long-term success that Alabama has, but I mean, they just keep reloading. Yeah. They're like they're gonna be, the and, then he see, and then then another one of his former guys, like at A&M, like they're obviously strong and, I just think that's maybe, and this is the NIL stuff is how he sees him losing a little, like that is he he's calling about parody and stuff. Like that's actually maybe one way because like we've talked about on, like on this show quite a bit, the NIL stuff does allow schools like quite literally the three examples that we tend to give Arkansas, Tennessee, Nebraska schools on that kind of caliber level who have the same financial base if not bigger than Alabama who now they are more of while they weren't really a threat um you know the last 15 years he's been there now all of a sudden they've elevated to levels that maybe even these schools are more of a threat um it's not just you know pretty much his whole time in Alabama there's been maybe one school that's a true threat that year maybe it's LSU it's been Georgia recently Auburn's been up there a little bit Florida State Florida Yeah, someone who yeah. gets hot, yeah. Clemson, but yeah, Clemson, but it's pretty much been Alabama and somebody else. Yeah, I think you're going to see more programs or elevate to at least where they're nipping right at the heels um, of Alabama. I think. I mean, I that's that's kind of what I feel in between the lines of his comments is like, you know, I'm not going to be the most powerful forever, um, especially if this kind of continues this way. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I kind of wanted to transition into this kind of the general ideas and the general what's going to happen with NIL, basically. So and I said this before, I was asking you all before the podcast, if you thought Alabama's pockets were deep enough and all that. And really what I think. I think really what I meant by that, too, is what's been kind of Alabama's biggest strength through this Saban era, through the dynasty, is they're like three deep at every position. You know, they keep reloading. Yeah. Whenever and somebody you, gets hurt or anything happens, they're well, – And you have guys who are willing to sit those first couple years, you know, and wait till they're a junior because they know if they get one good year in or two good years in, they're going to be – get drafted a, first or second round. Yeah, exactly. So – and I say this because the Huskers actually have recently gotten two Alabama transfers. One uh, that they just got was a nose tackle – that I think was actually there for a few years. And honestly, it's probably like a third stringer at Bama, but really has a chance to start at Nebraska. And then they also got a safety who I think is around, I want to say a sophomore. So he'll have th- about three years of eligibility. So, it, and that just kind of brought to my mind, it is going to change a lot of things for Bama because are you really going to want to be third string at Bama? If with name, image, and likeness, you know, you're making money off of, being known yeah you know you're not 100%. making money if you're sitting on the bench so there is a way bigger incentive now to go out play early get paid so while I think you know Alabama any big school that cares about football right y- y'all said it they're gonna pay for what they want however are they gonna pay for a guy who is like third string on the depth chart like are they gonna be able to there has to be a limit at some point in my mind you know especially there because I, I think about it, you know, Nebraska, we paid Oshawn Mathis, it sounds like half a mil, a guy who like might start. Like, I think he probably will, but it's, we're not, we didn't pay half a mil for a superstar. I hope he is. But as far as we know, this is a guy who might play for us. Like he's not getting that money any, like somewhere else. Right. So that'll, I think that's interesting to how it all is going to play out with everyone in college football. Yeah, I'm definitely interested to see how it plays out. And Tennessee has definitely kind of benefited alongside, similar to Nebraska. I mean, you look at uh, Nico, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, Alamale, something, the Hawaiian name or or Polynesian. Um, 
Ew, there were reports that we paid him like seven million dollars. I don't believe that was actually true. I think it's he can make that much. Yeah, he can make that much. And uh, a lot of people are saying the the Spire Group, the Spire Collective at Tennessee, is the best uh, collective in NIL out there. I've been seeing a lot of uh, them kind of at the top. So, I mean, I think it's it's really really going to make college football interesting and more parity and just kind of spreading the wealth uh, across the board in terms of recruits. So really I'm looking forward to, to how all this NIL stuff pl- plays out. And it's easy to say that from a team that's historically been great struggled, but has the financials to kind of get back to that greatness. So yeah, from, from my point of view and from Will and Seth, your point of view, it looks great, but I, I think it's just going to make things more interesting and just add another, uh, kind of piece to the game um that it comes to recruiting and comes to all these boosters having to to pool money together so i'm really uh, excited about that um i also wanted to not not to drag us off topic too far here but i also wanted to mention did you guys see that the ncaa is doing away with mandated um conference tournament championship or conference excuse me conference championship um like requirements. So now the PAC 12 will, it'll just be, they immediately decided now that the NCAA isn't ruling over kind of all uh, the different conferences that they, it'll be the top two uh, teams in the whole conference, not each division winner. Um, Well, it's funny you mentioned that because yeah, there's been, I, I don't think we actually talked about this before the podcast, but we can definitely jump into it. There's been a lot of talk about the SEC going into the pod format, Seth. I know you tweeted some stuff out about that. And then I think something uh, very recently, the Big Ten has, like, for the next few years, they had all their non-con games set up, and I think they had to erase them all. Or maybe it was their conference games. Maybe it was flipped. Like, if you go on, you can't see any of them anymore. So it looks like they may be doing the same thing as well, like changing – divisions or going into pods or how however that may work so yeah i think right now is just a a pivotal point in college football history that we're kind of standing in right now i mean the game is changing a lot and rapidly um and we're also seeing schools like oklahoma and texas obviously coming to the sec here soon uh just a lot of stuff is changing and the uh, how we know and how we see college football today Uh, obviously we had the playoff uh, implementation. What was it? 2013 or 2015. I mean, was the first one. Um, Uh, I think, yeah, 13, maybe. Or 2013. I know was um, all because Ohio state State, won it in 14. I remember that's when they won. they won playoffs. And yeah. So maybe it was 20 after the, 2013 because that was florida state yeah. and auburn uh when jimbo right, okay. speaking of jimbo he got his natty um but it, it's a garbage uh, natty that was it's I, auburn, that James. auburn team was not very good and well, they, they still had, should have won they had the two most amazing plays in all of college football history to get there the yeah exactly that's what i'm saying that auburn, team, Hare, that auburn team should have been six. nine and three bro they literally beat a nine and three team in the national championship that's so lame <laughs> yeah, I, I'll uh, I'll agree with you, Seth, on that. That I mean, that team was magic. I mean, what are you gonna do? Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't. It, it's crazy. <laughs> they, they won the games. They won the games. Yeah, like but... I, I can't really take it away from. Them. Um, they were the team. They were like the team of destiny until they. Yeah, they. The prayer until... of Jordan Hare was total BS. Like, yeah, that was stupid. That I mean, was they, James's, James's that was total, last that was an interception was... any other day. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Should have been a pick, but somehow just tipped so, up. And yeah. That is, it. dude, having those games back to back was just unreal. Like, that's not even fair. Those are two of the most hype, like, games to be at of all time. And they just happen back to back, like, same stadium, home game to be there against your two most bitter rivals. Yeah. I'm not kidding. I think I'm going to say some, I'm going to say some questionable stuff right now. I'm pretty sure Auburn made a pretty good deal with the devil. Like, I don't that know exactly year. what they know. I think they did it when they got Cam. They made a deal for oh, Cam. Oh, yeah, that's true. The, like, well, they, they made paid, a deal uh, on the planes for the de- for the, with the devil, and they had this just insane. But I think it's all, like, it's going to catch up to them. And I think I'm actually predicting Auburn to finish last in the SU West this year. Go ahead and a little teaser yeah. for my SEC uh, – uh, 
predictions and, and breakdowns that'll come soon in depth breakdown. That's not biased and completely above table. Um, but I think Auburn's, I think karma's going to catch up to them. Like they got so lucky there for a while. And it just seemed like they had just all the, all the good, all the good juju in the world. Yeah. And, and I even think that's going to come crashing What was it? Down. 2017 when they beat Alabama and then they beat Georgia in the regular season and then ended up getting, um, smoked by Georgia in the SEC uh, championship yeah. that year. So they even had some more recent – that was with Stidham, I think. Um, was that when UCF beat them? Yeah, that was – yes, that was the year UCF beat them, when yeah. UCF went uh, undefeated with Scott Frost. Harson, they got bad vibes at the Auburn Yeah, and I do right not now, like dude. Harson at all. Harson was not a great hire to start with. Dude who spent – you know how different – do you understand how just culturally impactful it is to have spent your whole life in Idaho and to try to come win yeah, football games, State. football games in the SEC at Auburn, Alabama? Like you could not be in more Southern of a place. Well, just and he's not Chris Peterson either. He didn't build yeah. that place from the ground up. Yeah. He just kind of came in and had some success, like pretty marginal success. Like, yeah, he was good. They were good. They won a good amount of games, but it's not like he was really like, I mean, he inherited well, and, a program that was pretty well off, too. Well, I was going to say, when you're in a conference like that, like a group of five where you kind of walk into a Boise or maybe even a UCF. Uh, I know UCF's a little different because they've had kind of solid coaches keep going in since Frost. But, like, walking into Boise when they are kind of the team of the group of five, like, you already have – anyone who's not getting a Power 5 offer kind of wants to go to Boise because they're kind of the next best thing. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't – then with all the turmoil in the offseason, <clears throat> just bad, lost, replaced. He hired three coordinators in one offseason. That's yeah. not good. No. You well, lost, like, I'll say you hired if Auburn one made a deal with him. the devil, that's a pretty bad deal. Like, they, <laughs> they haven't gotten much out of it. Like, they won well, a natty. Two nas- won a natty. I guess, okay, yeah, they got the one. Had two national they the championship that's appearances. What you were they yeah. won the natty and then had those two prayers. Maybe they made a deal with – the big man upstairs. Who knows what they? I did. don't think they so. They had though, to have done something. It was done they, dirty. Well, they pay. Didn't they make a, a a serious donation to Cam Newton's dad's church or something like that? Like, I don't was, know. It was some kind of sketchy deal like that, where oh. just all of a sudden, all these Auburn boosters were like giving a ton of money to Cam Newton's dad's church. <laughs> I mean, that's so, actually a really good loophole if you think about it. That is like, great. Yeah, because you're just genius. donating to charity. I mean, gotta respect yeah. that. Like, <laughs> no, I actually really, respect them. I respect Auburn buying Cam. Like, that was a good play. If you knew you could get one player, he's gonna like win, win you a natty. natty. It's yeah. worth. It's worth what possibly him. have the. I mean, besides Joe Burrow, probably the best single season a quarterback has ever had in college football. To just come in and just put the team on your back the whole yeah, and season. Do everything. What, the what were they down to Oregon? Was it 24 to three or was it? Uh, no, it wasn't against Oregon. It was Alabama. Alabama. It was, uh, yeah. It was yeah. down to Alabama 24 to three on the road. at Alabama too. Like, I mean, that's dang. Unheard that's tough. Of. That's Dude. Tough. I remember three hearing stories about that game in uh, T-Town. Dude, the story I loved about that game is apparently when they were when Auburn started making the comeback, Cam, he would get tackled and he would kind of lay down a little extra longer to pretend he was hurt or something. And then he'd jump up and start laughing at all the fans, just totally trolling them the whole time, just toying with them. <laughs> he did. That was Cam's thing. It's like he not only won, he also like orchestrated the crowd. Like he literally would. Yeah, he was a crowd pleaser. He sure. was sick. Cam was awesome. I, I didn't like that was actually one of Arkansas's really really good teams we played them at auburn that day and nick fairly had a dirty hit on ryan mallet knocked him out of the game and uh, you know who knows history could be different if the hogs were healthy that day but uh tyler wilson actually came in and balled out and we lost we lost it was like a crazy high scoring game they scored like 60 points but we scored like 48 uh it was Anyway, it was yeah, actually pretty exciting. Really, it was all Cam Newton that year. That their defense was good, but not like great by any means. Yeah. Uh, that, well, they were having what was score. the Natty though? The Natty was a low. The Natty was game. low scoring. They won like eighteen to twenty or something. Yeah, something like, like it, that. I don't even. Think, it was I thought it was low. like I didn't even think anyone scored twenty. Maybe they did, but. They kicked like I mean, a game-winning field goal, though, like maybe hit twenty or something. I, I can't remember yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that but was, it was. I mean, it that was, was against the all-powerful Oregon offense at the time. You know, that was when Oregon offense was like 
on no one had seen it before. Yeah, so it was 22 to 19. Okay, so yeah. That is kind of crazy that, yeah, those both were just dynamic offenses, and then you get to the championship and it kind of locks down. And well, that championship they had against Florida State was another super low scoring game. Yeah, it was. If I remember. And I mean, the if Auburn went up with what, like a minute to go or two minutes to go? Was that um, when Trey Mason like broke yeah, off? Yeah, Trey Mason busted run. a 20 yarder. If he would have just gone down at the five yard line, they squeezed a little bit more clock. I don't know if Jameis would have had enough time to. to Did they already like, have the off. lead? No, they didn't have the lead, but I'm just saying yeah, you, you got to take the touchdown. Ballsy <laughs> you got to take the, the touchdown, five. but I mean, also uh, with how amazing Jameis was in college, you, you got to be a little, I don't know. It's, it, it's easy to say that looking back now, but I mean, I think you, you Trey Mason probably made the right move. You got to take the touchdown if you got a wide open one right there. Yeah. Um, Let's, uh, what what we were kind of talking about earlier with the pods, do you I want to hear y'all's kind of thoughts on that? Because to me, it looks like pretty soon college football may be moving away from the NCAA with all this kind of realignment. Yeah. And I like the idea that I keep hearing of like the power five may kind of separate itself as even like a different division, you know, especially now that you have I mean, you can add some of these lower level teams that have had success like UCF, Cincinnati, maybe even Boise teams like that. Or and then independence, BYU, Notre Dame, obviously. You can kind of throw those into this upper echelon division, and then you kind of have everyone else. Do y'all like what are y'all's thoughts on that? Do you foresee a big divide or a move away from the NCAA? How do you think it's gonna work out? I say screw the NCAA. I'm I'm all here for, all all for getting away from the NCAA. And I mean, I think we can pretty much all say a power five team deserves to win the national championship every year. We saw kind of what would happen if Cincinnati, since they made the playoffs at number four, I mean, Alabama took care of business and they never really had a shot. So I think it's fine if you want to declare a kind of separate group and separate national championship division um, for these teams. Cause I, I think they're just that, far ahead of the the group of five the talent is so different and the speed at which the game is played in the sec is so different um or especially the sec so i'm i'm fine with letting kind of each little pod break out and create their own rules create their own kind of tournaments and playoffs and i'm i'm all here for that i kind of see it as given given the power back to the states almost let uh let everybody decide well, whatever they want to do. I mean, I, I think the NCAA has been holding things back for too long now. We need to get away from it. Let, let the boys play. I'm, uh, I'm here for the change, and I'm excited to see what the future is going to hold. So that's not really a, a, a very direct answer, but I'm just excited for the change, really. I got a, a, a shake-up to the NCAA. Uh, I got a more direct plan. I'd actually like to be I, – I actually think if you put my, my title right now, you said, Seth, your job – it's not going to happen for eight years, but you're going to set us up the perfect, like you're, you're going to, you're going to spend commish. time. Yeah. You are the commissioner of the newly formed, you know, power, power six, power four, whatever. You're the commissioner of the new league, the league of champions. Um, and actually to mention that, I think the best thing that could ever happen. Uh, well, I don't know. I would like to see it happen is relegation. I was about to say champions. I want to yeah, I this. I want to I want to talk about this too. Would yeah, be go ahead. So sick. Because I think there is my my true view of it would be four 16 team conferences. So you have probably a Pac-12 conference, you have or a you know Pacific West, a Western conference, you have kind of the a Southern conference, which the SEC is almost there right now. So if you add Texas and Oklahoma, that puts them at 16. Um, and that's uh, – there will be four 16-team conferences. Uh, so the Big Ten kind of becomes a 16-team conference. And then the ACC, uh, I don't know how exactly it shakes out. I've thought about it, and I've actually – I do have an idea, of, but I don't know off the top of my head exactly you know, what those teams look like. But it's fairly like those leagues are right now with just a little bit of reshuffling. Um, but – for the teams like Memphis, for the teams like UCF, 
for the teams like Houston, who obviously has shown in basketball, they've gone like back to back elite eights. Like they are a serious contender in sports. Um, I think there should be an opportunity to jump into those power leagues. Like I, and it makes, it makes it so much more fun. The regular season, it matters for everybody. Um, it matters all the way down to team number 14 because you are in danger of not being in the SEC next year. Like if you, if you are last in the conference and it's, and I think there should be a game like, okay, you got last in the conference after the regular season. Uh, these two teams are eligible so like to losers jump bowl. in a loser's bowl. And it's like, it's for big things. Like it's not just a, a bowl game. It's like, yeah, you no. lose if a Vander, lot of if Vanderbilt yeah. loses this game. They're, they're playing in conference USA next year. So it's almost like they would have to have some kind of uh, like uh, organization where they are affiliated. So it's like the SEC and conference USA are kind of like sister or brother, sister conferences, because it's like, they are our kind of, they're the same footprint. You know, it's, it's the South. It's, it's all those States, um, but different conference. I don't know exactly how that works. Maybe the, maybe it's the power. It's a four, 16 team conferences. And then you have a group of other schools that, you know, that play. Um, and maybe it's just one big like secondary conference because there will be some schools that still want to play football. Um, and, and I feel like you probably will see schools move away from football, honestly, um, that, that are, that, that get pushed out, you know, schools that already like, I don't know, they already weren't very good. They kind of, it, it wasn't a big program. Like they don't, they're not really revenue bringing because especially if you go, you're going to lose out on what little TV deals you already had. Like the big schools will obviously, you know, be great with TV deals. You know, the SEC's TV deals are going to be bringing in money, but you get some of these scholar schools and like, they're not going to be bringing in revenue and it's hard to support a hundred man roster. Football is an expensive sport to just upkeep. Um, so I, I think you could def and I feel like football numbers across the country are going down. Like people playing football, I feel like at a high school level is quite literally declining. So your pool of players is even smaller. Uh, so it's harder to fill the roster. And if you're not playing for the championship, like what are you really playing for? They have plenty of D2 schools and D3 and, and that'll all resettle. And those, those honestly may still be part of the NCAA. I could see the NCAA still residing over kind of but I could see an organization rising above and saying, we don't need the NCAA to go. Like we don't need a governing body to promote us. Like we, we promote ourselves. Like we're actually the ones bringing you money. Um, so I could definitely see that happening. Seeing 16 team leagues would be fun. Um, I would be, I don't, I don't necessarily care about the pods or not. I could still do divisions and you play 10, 10 conference games, right? You play seven, you're seven in your division, and then you play three crossovers into the other division. Maybe one's constant. Pods would be cool. I've always thought if you really could figure out a way to theoretically schedule everybody home and away in your four years. So you play every single school in the SEC twice, and you play them at home and away, and you play some schools every year. Um, but, yeah, pods would work. Um, uh, that'd be pretty fun. Like if Arkansas was in a pod with Texas A&M and Oklahoma or something, or they probably wouldn't, it'd probably be, let's just hypothetically talk SEC with, with Texas and Oklahoma. I think those two, when they leave the big 12, I think that's the year around you're going to see massive shift, yeah. which is upcoming, but it still could be, it's not, they're obviously not this year. And it, it, I could see it honestly being next football season, not, not this upcoming season, but the one after. Okay, so you got Texas, Oklahoma, A and M, and I don't know LSU. Let's see. No, I don't know. I feel like <clears throat> I feel like you put LSU, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, and A and M. Maybe. Yeah, it gets funky in that region because yeah. you kind of you could go kind of SWC because you a could put with it. You could put Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, and Oklahoma. I feel like that'd be a pretty good pod. And then, yeah, you got Mississippi State, Ole Miss, LSU, and A&M. That's a good, that's a good pod. Yeah. Then you got um, Tennessee, Vandy, Kentucky, and – South Carolina. That's a pretty rough pod. That's where you have the kind of weak pod. <laughs> but, but I think Maybe you, you got to split up because you can't, you can't go like 
You could do Georgia or Florida in there probably. Yeah. Which You'd I know Florida's go, not very good right now, but. I don't know. You may even split. I don't know. Do you split Auburn and Alabama? Like, do you, can you still have a overlapping rivalry that it's a yeah? You could still year? you could still play the the rivalry Iron, game the every Iron year. Bowl. Yeah. So I honestly think you go Alabama, Alabama, uh, Vandy, Kentucky, Tennessee. I think that's, that's pretty strong. Pod, that's a quad. Yeah. And then, um, yes, yeah, South Carolina, Auburn, Georgia, Florida. That's a pretty strong pod. I, I think, think that's pretty, actually pretty even across the board. It seems like pretty even. Like, obviously, everyone's going to have ebbs and flows, but, like, across the board, about as even as you can probably go. And then, like, Arkansas for, like – and, you, yeah, you probably try to keep one or two – one rivalry, two rivalries maybe outside of your pod. So, like – or or your pod always kind of matches up with the I – don't, I don't know exactly how the scheduling works, but I could see them going to, like – reducing back down to a 12 game schedule which i guess they are right now 10 game sec schedule 10 game conference schedule and two two non-conference games do you have too many conference games though no it's awesome think about wasn't that fun when it was a only a 10 game sec schedule like, yeah but it is it just sick. comes down to the like you do kind of have to have a couple cupcakes on your schedule just to be i feel like how many games wait so they, they only play eight right now don't they Eight uh, conference. I know Big yeah. Ten plays nine, I think. And then, yeah. yeah, I think SEC plays eight, maybe. Yeah, that would be a big jump to 10. I, that's what I thought. That's what I wanted. But see, that's that'd be cool. <laughs> I'd like, I'd like 10. It would be two. cool. It would just be a grind, kind of. It'd be a huge, like, no, that'd be a huge, like, winning. It, it makes it way more like winning the SEC at that point becomes just ma- monumental. Um, I think, I think you if do you away do with that, then you essentially championship games. I don't know. I think if you do a 10 game SEC schedule, you essentially have to schedule two cupcakes, which I mean, you could do, or that might be, you know, as far as you get into TV deals and money and stuff, like you do need to have some big out of conference games. I actually think, okay, all right, we'll, bu- we'll bump it back down to maybe nine games. I want a first game of the season. I want a inner conference tournaments. So I want I, it's ranked out. It's literally just ranked out. You you're number three in the SEC. Okay. You're you're always matching up versus number three in the Big Ten. Or maybe it's even pod wise. Like if the Big Ten adopted pod or Big 16 adopts pods, it's like, okay, so it's Wisconsin, Nebraska, Minnesota, and uh Northwestern, let's just say that's just my four. I, I it's random. But so that pod always matches up with like Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, Missouri. Like, so it's like one through four, you get ranked like the NFL does it because that's how they do it. You know, the AFC South this year is matching up with the NFC West. And so it's like one through four just plays one through four. So it just creates kind of fun matchups. That's like every year, maybe, you know, it could rotate and stuff, but you kind of know it's like a set, you play a set conference, uh, like a not, not your conference, but a power conference opponent based on kind of how you finished last year it's like a bowl game but the start of the years it's just like a big tournament like a big kind of pre it's not preseason it counts it's real um but it is kind of a jamboree because at that i'm thinking eight game playoff too trucial i know you had a little backlash on that the other day uh 18 playoff is sick who cares like more the merrier it's not it's not that much though it's one more game well, it's like, do away with the conference thing. championships. Conference championships. I just don't, don't think it'll affect all. anything. Well, if you have so, if you go to this schedule, no, if you go to what Seth's talking about, I could see it where, yeah, if you're playing a, so many conference games and you want to like pull everyone out of each conference, eight teams kind of makes sense just because you haven't, uh, I don't know, you just kind of beat up on each other and everything, and it won't. It won't devalue the regular season. That's my greatest kind of tiff yeah, with the whole true. expanding to the 18 playoff. I like it at four because it truly matters right now. If you lose one game, there's a very good chance like you're out. Like if you lose two, it's almost like you're definitely out unless you're an SEC champion, you know. That's kind of why I like it at four right now. But if you go to these giant conferences where everyone's going to – it's going to be a little more even playing field – and you're not That's worried true. about someone jumping in who's not that good or anything. Like everyone's going to be like pretty good. And you know? yeah, probably not. The eight's going to lose to the one most often, uh, and maybe ninety percent of the time. But I, it, 
And may, maybe 95 percent the time. But there's going to be some seven two upsets. There's going to be some six three upsets for sure. That's true. Like, it's going to happen. That. And if it doesn't, one year, two years, who cares? Like, okay, they proved it again that they're the top four teams. They got to host a playoff game. That's one big part of it. The first round is on campus because playoff games on campus would be that would so be sick. electric. That'd okay, be so sick. You're starting to swing me a little bit here. I, that's what I'm saying. That's like because well, you're going business. Yeah, if you go business side with it, then it makes sense. If you're trying to make money, it definitely makes sense. Yeah, so that's where I think we're probably honestly just the stars are kind of aligning that it's going to big conferences. And I think it's probably, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's where we're headed. The NCAA was kind of a, honestly, the NCAA has shown itself. The incompetency yeah. is just pretty right now. I mean, I, I talk a lot of garbage. They do, a, they do a pretty good job of organizing college sports, which is essentially their goal. But in terms of like, but just let them handle like track and swimming and yeah. stuff like that. Let them, let them have that. They don't need to have college football. They can do March madness. That's cool. Sure. Uh, maybe we can start <laughs> phasing that out too. That'd be nice. Well, here's, You're gonna I, I want to say out March one... madness. No phase out the NCAA from March madness and let actually March madness become its own like conglomerate. Its own brand. Yeah. Its own entity. All right, I'm going to say one more thing about this, and then, Trucial, if you, you can throw in your kind of two cents, and then we'll, we'll move on. But going back to the whole relegation thing, the reason I love relegation is because, yeah, Trucial, you're right. Maybe Cincinnati, they can't compete with Bama. But, okay, outside of Bama, Georgia, Cincinnati is probably competing with everyone else in the SEC. Definitely everyone else in the Big Ten, maybe outside of Ohio State or someone. Like, they're good enough, and they can bring in more money than a lot of these super lower-level teams. Like, that Vanderbilt is, is straight up just cashing yeah, checks they're useless. from being in the SEC. You know, like, they're, they're not even – I don't even – I don't know how much money they make off of football. I have to assume pretty much the money they do make is from the TV deals that they get because they're in the SEC. Or when all these teams win bowl games or championships, they get a cut of that. So that's why I kind of like the whole relegation thing because it gives you an incentive, like, hey, not only is it bad that you haven't had a lot of success and you're not bringing revenue at your own school, but no, like you need to do this because otherwise you're kind of a burden to everyone else in your conference as well. And I'm not saying you have, I don't know, like maybe college football breaks away on its own. I think college football is powerful enough to do that and has enough revenue to do that. I don't think you have to do that for every sport. Maybe it's easier though if you do that. And again, I don't think that's a problem either because what is – Vandy, yeah, baseball, you win some national championships. Baseball doesn't bring in any money. The revenue, like, I think Vandy breaks even in baseball, and they're one of the top earning teams in the SEC, obviously. But I, I digress. That's just kind of my thoughts on it. I like that idea because it gives an even bigger incentive to be successful in football. Plus then, I mean, Vandy took forever to even invest in their football program. Yeah, they, they just now put year. money. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that gives you an incentive. Hey, maybe we should invest a little more into this so we can start winning games and don't get kicked out of here. The threat of getting kicked out makes it pretty, pretty interesting. And maybe it's not success totally, but it's also revenue based. It'd be like a two year rolling thing too, where it's like, you know you get a warning yeah it's not like you're just immediately one bad season and you're out it's like okay you didn't have a good one last year like if you have another bad season you are getting relegated you can earn the right to get back that's the thing about relegation is like you get relegated yeah, you well you got to relegate yourself back um but i think it, it adds it adds a lot of intrigue for me personally to watch the teams near the bottom fight to like stay on the top level because if you're not on the top level then you can't win a championship next year so it's like well dull but you may even still play some of the same i don't know somehow you may even schedule some of the same opponent like your are i don't know it'd be interesting to see relegation is super intriguing when it comes to college football it just it'll be sick I definitely like the relegation piece and I've been looking up some stuff just about Vanderbilt. Cause they're obviously top of mind of being relegated. Uh, we all just immediately SEC. go to Vandy, but so their bowl record all time is four, four and one <laughs> all time. 500. And Vanderbilt is a founding member of the sec. Like 
how is that possible? You've only made <laughs> nine bowl. You haven't even made double digit bowl games. Like get them out of the SEC, get them out, get them out. And I, I mean, obviously coming from a Tennessee fan, but Hey, I, it, it'd be fun to, well, what would happen if let's say we keep Tennessee and Vanderbilt, that rivalry game, if they get relegated, would they no longer play? Like what, what you could turn, I mean, may, yeah, that's that's where it gets fishy. You could or you could not. I mean, maybe that's a non-conference game you start playing. Yeah. Then you'd have to get into all the scheduling conflicts. I think it would just be done until they get back. So that maybe would be a little weird for some kind of rivalries, but I mean, I mean, honestly, to tell you the truth, as a pretty like as a Tennessee fan, I don't think it would hurt me a whole lot if you were like, no. oh, you don't get to play Vandy. I'd be like, like yeah, well, instead you get to play. Memphis, I'd just be like, be dang, unique. like that free win is gone now. That kind yeah. of sucks, but like. <laughs> I mean, besides the the James Franklin era, we won't talk about. Um, but like the Tennessee Vanderbilt rivalry doesn't stand up to Tennessee, Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, Tennessee, no, Bama. No, like no. I, I get we haven't even had a lot of success against all those teams in a while, but that's still a game that it, there's just you get more pageantry more. and yeah. tradition behind those than there is Tennessee Vandy. So, yeah, I think uh, I'm here for the. I'm here for the, the, the relegation of teams. Um, I think it'd be, like I said, a little hairy with maybe some of the rivalry games um, as like, let's say Auburn, they go through like a really bad stretch here. Um, they just tumble. And what if they get relegated from the sec? Tough. That would just kind of be crazy. Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> like, like you earned relegation. Yeah. It you earned relegation. Luck. You it's earned it luck. by that is being true. terrible. See, so, I didn't think I that you like, have to, you have to take into account revenue still somehow. I don't know if it's like, is it straight up just, Hey, you're not playing well, you're out. Or is it a combination of, Hey, not only you're not playing well, but you're also not making any money. I kind of like that angle. Cause I mean, let's say, uh, but then what if Texas, your team was example, going, who's been playing kind of poorly and down, if they continue that streak, but they make a ton, ton of money. Do you relegate them? It'd be tough for the sec to, to kick them out when they're bringing in a lot of that revenue. Well, it's like Nebraska going four and eight, but still selling out every game. You know, do you, what if, uh, say Northwestern's six and six, but they're not bringing in as near as much money that causes an issue there, right? Because you have a team who's more successful, but they're not bringing in as much money. Can you relegate them? I don't know. No, I think you got to play for it. Maybe like the bottom two teams play in the league. And then the team who loses that plays the relegation bowl against the top team. So it's like you have two chances to like not get relegated, even if you are in position to get relegated. There are a lot of kinks to work out in the relegation game plan, but that's why I said I got a few years to yeah, really you, – you've got like eight years. In, I just think we, we talk about this as if it's like about to happen, but I truly believe this would be a great solution for college football. And I think by the year – if we call it eight years, 2030 – Oh, it's going to look so different perfect. by 2030. Yeah, and it's going to look so different. And I'm here for the changes. I, I mean, People I are think, ready for change. Yeah, ready for change. Um, and one thing that I was just randomly thinking about here, um, speaking of changes, do you see uh, all the construction on Neyland Stadium has uh, fully gone underway? And now Neyland Stadium is under 100,000 seats capacity. Oh, is it really? Yeah. For the I didn't know the first time. It, so. uh, yeah, that since is 2000. Like symbolically tough. Yeah, I know. I, and it's kind of out of left field, but I was just thinking about um, stuff like this. And I was seeing some pictures of some folks in Knoxville that were there for graduation were taking pictures of all the construction going on in Neyland. Um, but party yeah, deck, though. The party deck is going to be insane. Like it's going to be worth it. And now we'll actually have a better chance of selling out some games, which will be awesome. Um, that's the thing, I mean, right? Like you, we weren't, we weren't selling out 102,000, like we weren't doing it. So like, like, unless it was, I mean, you did, if it was Florida and it was a giant game, but yeah, even it was tough. like, even then it was still tough, especially with how down Tennessee has been. So I don't hate it, but I thought I'd just bring that up as a little, uh, factoid. And speaking of expansions, um, I want to talk a little bit of NFL, if that's cool with uh, you guys. Did you see the Washington Commanders spent a hundred million dollars <laughs> in buying land uh, for a new stadium? Yeah, and it's like forty. It's like an hour south of downtown DC. Dude, yeah. why? Two hundred acres. 
Because they're one of the most poorly run franchises in the history yeah. of sports. Ben Snyder's an idiot. Like, he has no clue what's going on. He is an idiot. I do know that much. He does not have his finger on the pulse. Commanders, whatever. Um, and did you guys see that Nick Foles signed with the Colts? Yes, we did see that. He's now back with two Frank garbage now. quarterbacks. I don't know. No, I'm right. not. Nick Foles does not. I don't think he's going to see the field. No, he's Nick gonna, Foles was just with the Jags, wasn't he? Like he was hurt though. That's the last time I remember him play, playing the Titans. Yeah, but um, anything the Colts have done does not really terrify me. Matt Ryan is like forty, can't move. Have you watched Matt Ryan play recently? Yeah, he just he did not look good last year in he that did Arthur not Smith system. Look good. System. He is so immobile. It it almost hurts. Like his legs are like bricks. They're like cement blocks. So, but shout yeah, out Matty Ice, scared. good quarterback. At yeah, one point great, his... great quarterback, and had a a good, I mean, ten year kind of run. Yeah, uh, I mean, he's been good for a long time. No, he's he's I mean, no, he was great. It. He's like he a, was great. He well, he won an MVP it. and made it to a Super Bowl, so he was I mean, truly he, a great quarterback. For yeah, for a five year window, I'd say you could say Matt Ryan was great, and he was good outside of that. Outside of that, now is garbage. Um, he was good enough to win a Super Bowl. He is kind of garbage. Yeah. Colts, I mean, Colts, 28 to three is pretty yeah, the, insane. The Colts are, <laughs> they keep just bringing in retreads. They got yeah. spoiled with Andrew Luck, booed him off, and they're going to be in quarterback purgatory Such for the rest of the Such scumbag fans to do that for a guy that has literally given his blood and body and everything that he had till he was decrepit, essentially, and could not play the game that he loved. And he did it all for the Colts, especially. Like, I, don't, I it, their fans just piss me off so much. And my neighbors are all from in, Indiana and they're all big Colts fans. So I'm always, I'm hearing it all day long. Um, but, First, they got excited about freaking Philip Rivers, who was yeah. about 80. Then they got excited about Carson Wentz. You got excited. You thought Carson Wentz was going to win? Hey, they weren't <laughs> alone, alone. The lawyer thought Carson Wentz was going to win MVP. I mean, that's just. <sighs> That's sacrilegious as a Titans. We do get a we words. get me and Seth. We get a text from from our good friend, the lawyer Thomas Swafford. He says, "Hey, did y'all see the Colts got Carson Wentz? Might as well just mail it in this year." <laughs> <laughs> Speaking That's of what the people, uh, legitimately thought though. I don't know if Thomas. Yeah. Like, who knows? Thomas this is an idiot. Well, that yeah, is, people thought idiot, Frank who Reich I love very deeply kind of tied but. back with Carson Wentz that it was going to immediately go back to the 2017 Eagles. But I mean, that team was loaded outside of the quarterback position, especially from an offensive line standpoint and a defensive standpoint. Um, but also, I was kind of thinking about uh, with talking these commanders, uh, new stadium. What do you guys think about this stuff? More and more, I keep hearing more and more heat pick up around uh, this new stadium for the Titans and that it's going to be a dome and like all this stuff. What do you guys think about getting rid of Nissan? I mean, it'll be kind of sad in a way. I mean, yeah, I think no turf, do- some kind of yeah, dome no makes turf. the most sense. I'd like a retractable roof personally. Yeah. That would make sense. Cause then you can host a ton of events, make a ton of money, all that. I get that. I do. Part of me, finds it attractive that on a like 28 degree day I can go in a dome and be all toasty but at the same time I kind of I kind of miss going in for a code blue night game where I'm just freezing my balls off it's snowing in December it's December football the playoffs are right around the corner it's a game you have to win you know plus Derrick Henry in the cold yeah that's gonna hurt because I like having Derrick Henry in the cold D Henber D yeah D Henber which I'm excited to see Henry return to greatness. So many speaking of Colts fans talking about Jonathan Taylor, as if he's the new biggest, shiny, amazing running back. You forgot about someone else in your division folks that was dominating the running back position before he got hurt. Yeah. Yeah, He was having his best weeks of Derrick Henry, not playing the pass him in the rushing yards category. Yeah. So it's, I think Henry's going to come back with a vengeance. And they, he might, he could go because he was on pace for 2000 again last season. Um, what if, what if he goes for 2000 again? I mean, that would be, be unreal. Would you, would he so cement sick. himself as the greatest running back of all time? I think the conversation's there. If he goes sure. 2K again, 
I mean, and it's definitely produces with a, like a two more fifteen hundred yards with seventeen seasons. games. Because it does, he does have the extra game, and I mean, OJ did it in fourteen, which is insane. Yeah, he but did OJ's it in fourteen out of the conversation. games. Yeah, he's out of the conversation as you can't be a, he's murderer, a murderer and be a, the greatest running back of all time. Yeah, well, I mean, people say Ray Lewis is up there with one of the greatest linebackers of all time, and he's a murderer. Um, a couple times least, over. Yeah, uh, <laughs> involved in multiple murders somehow. Yeah, but, but he was a linebacker. Yeah, so. it, it's not the kind of fancy. <laughs> Like it's okay to be a murderer if you're a linebacker. If you well, it's like defense. part of the deal, it kind yeah. of makes sense. <laughs> um, it makes sense, but not if the a, Titans, a uh, if the Titans make a new stadium, first of all, if we put in AstroTurf, I will lose my brains. If the if we put in AstroTurf, I will seriously, and this is as dead serious. Like I will seriously consider like not supporting the Titans. AstroTurf. Like, do you I'm talking mean- about well, just like turf like turf okay. and it turf. better be real grass like if, if the titans aren't playing on real we, we're in nashville tennessee we can grow good grass like we should be playing in real grass if it's a dome or whatever okay i can maybe get behind it i okay i'm so biased on this because i am taking out the benefit for the city of nashville i don't care this is a titans football stadium like that is the main concern for this facility is the tennessee football titans okay like I'm not okay. Whoop de doo. I can do more concerts. I've I've been to fun concerts at Nissan Stadium. First of all, like I don't really care that we can host a Final Four. To be quite honest, I want to host Tennessee Titans football playoff games in ten degree weather in Nissan Coliseum. Like I don't I don't want I don't want a dome. It's not fun. Okay, domes are cool. They make cool domes now. Like. As that long as it's thing, retractable, it's like a, I'm cool like, with it. Like I flew by the SoFi Stadium recently. Like oh, that's I've right by the airport that there. Person, yeah. And it is sick. <laughs> I will be honest. It is dope. But I don't see them putting quite that kind of stadium. I mean, maybe it was something super cool. They make domes cool these days, and I'll probably like it once they do it. But I'm kind of going to be – My thing is, it seems like they're putting the Titans on like the back burner and it's more important about other stuff. That's what really bothers me. It's a Titans football stadium. Like the main concern, the main concern shouldn't be hosting, uh, you know, the final four or hosting more concerts. Like we have plenty of concert venues in Nashville, a Super Bowl. If they, if the NFL was real, if the NFL was a real one, they would play the Super Bowl outside. Who cares? You play the whole the whole year outside. Go play like the Super that. Bowl in February in Tennessee. It's not going to be that cold. Like, you know, if you schedule a Super Bowl for February in Green Bay, you could get negative 10 degrees. It's most likely going to be, you know, yeah, it might be 18 degrees, but it's like that's pretty doable for a football game. Like, we're all here. I'd I love know. that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't care about hosting a Super Bowl. Honestly, I want to host an really AFC either. championship game. Like that's what I want to host an AFC championship game in, and let our defense just rack up in the freezing cold. Like I went to, I was at the Jacksonville Jaguars game, like 2018, maybe coldest game in Titans, like home history. It was Chile, Chile, but it was fun. It's my, one of my most memorable, like it was the most fun I've ever had in Nissan stadium. Because it was just like everyone just locked in for the Titans. Like, no, we're bearing this cold. We're out here in the miserable conditions to watch the Titans beat the Jags. Like, that's that's legendary. That's what we need. But the Titans are soft, just like the city of Nashville, just like the Preds. Hold up. Let's touch on the Preds. Oh, we need to. Yo, extending. Yo, yo. Hines and Poyle, are you kidding me? When they said, when Poyle said the other day, he said, we're on the right track. What? Shut up, dude. <laughs> We literally could not be more on the wrong track. We're quite, we're going backwards. Like we, we were almost worse, there. Like we were, year. we were on the right track. We were getting better every year and we literally are getting worse every year. We just got swept out of the first round of the playoffs. We're not on the right track. And it wasn't even wrong close track. either. It wasn't even close. Colorado was so much better than the Predators. Well, like, so much better. And obviously Saros getting hurt has something to do with it, but. I mean, still, that has to be on the the coaches and GM for 
absolutely wearing out Soros at the end of the year and being in a position where we're having to scrap for games just to get into the playoffs. I do have, I've got a couple of things to say about this because I had to, I watched Poyle and Heinz's pressers uh, that came out, I guess it was last week. And so here's the thing. Poyle, I understood there. I, I understand the plan they keep talking about because the Preds did do a couple things. They, I think have one of the, they went from being like second or third oldest team in the league to second or third youngest. So there is something to be said about all these guys who are 19 to 21, who have quite literally never played an 82 game season until this year due to COVID and everything kind of burning out towards the end. And the fact that the Preds did lead in rookie goal scorers and rookie point scorers. So there is kind of something to at least be said about that. I think you do have a young team. If you don't get Forsberg back, <laughs> this whole plan is done for. Like, yeah, you're, yeah. you're that's it. But what really irked me was Poyle at the end of the season. You know, you talk about all the things you accomplished, I guess, or whatever. What really pissed me off is he started talking about how hard it is to win in the NHL and how everyone's rebuilding every year, all this stuff. And I'm like, dude, I'm not an idiot. I understand it's hard to win in a professional sports league. You don't need to tell me that. <laughs> but what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Like, I get you have all this it's stuff. It's not going to get said Every other team has to rebuild every year. Okay, so why are they winning? Why You're going we, the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, dude, that's great. You have a plan. You got a bunch of young players. But I, we're not going to sit around for four or five years while you sit. Like, how long is it going to take? Don't tell me it's going to take time or everything. You've been the GM since 97, man. You should know what you're doing. Like, keep us up there. I don't know. I actually don't hate Hines either. I do just because I think Hines is like a gritty kind of no nonsense guy. I I'm not smart enough about hockey to give you all the X's and O's. And if he's doing all that, right. But Poyle man is just pissing me off just because he just seems like such a bitch out there when he's talking to the media. I'm like, dude, let's get, I mean, just stop making excuses. Just do it. Yeah. This his post And, and I see this as more of an out. I'm not, super plugged into the Preds quite often, but I did pay attention to that because I was curious because as an outside, I'm ready to make some moves as someone who's not seriously invested. I'm ready to make a move right now. Um, so I was kind of reading those comments and it was just like, who do you think you're talking to? Like we have eyes, like we, we watched this happen in real time and like, I would have rather you say like this season was honestly objectively a failure. Like say that to me, say yeah. like, yeah, we're going to make changes. Don't say we are on the right track because that's just not true. Uh, and maybe the, maybe if your plan is five years away, but you're, there is a very wide gap. Uh, Colorado is great. They're a really good team. They may well win the Stanley cup. So but that's the standard. That's where you want to be. And there's obviously a wide gap between us and them. You also uh, shouldn't have been playing them anyway. No. Oh, yeah. No. There's a, giving up a, what was it, a uh, 4 0 lead? Um, yeah, at the, the end of the season and losing that game to play Colorado <laughs> instead of Calgary. Um, I mean, that uh, was I just guess. so stupid. So stupid. Well, and I'm going to play devil's advocate here real quick. So most people didn't predict the Preds to go to the playoffs this year. So, was this season objectively a failure? Who cares what the predict like? <laughs> I'm go I'm going in with the mindset of bring home Stanley, bring Stanley home every or year, or at least make a run at it. Yeah, like make a run. Like I feel like, especially in the NHL, like just having the the right foundation and having the right team culture and just grittiness to your team can make such a big difference in hockey. I feel like I, I see so often teams that are lower seated, make big runs just like the Preds did in 2017. I mean, that team had so much heart. Um, and yeah, I don't know if the Preds are ever going to have that big goal score like McKinnon um, or really have that big, big name guy. Well, you had two forty goal scorers. For yeah. The for the first time, time ever. history. Yeah. No, that's true, but I think that's a little bit on, on the way the league is going. Um, so I think it's more of a just kind of mentality thing. We need to look in at going – It's we need to make a run in the playoffs and put ourselves in a position to, to win a championship. 
every year. I, I think at this point, I don't think the, the Preds need to blow things up and rebuild. Um, that would be pretty frustrating to me. I think uh, we've been on the cusp. We obviously made the, made the uh, Stanley cup finals in 2017 and lost, which really hurt, but um, I don't know. I, I could go off on a tangent here, but I, I think, the Preds are not that far away from getting back to that point. And now is not the time to kind of blow things up. And maybe what some of the people were saying, yeah, the Preds are going to be no good. Uh, they're a really young team. Like you said, Will, we've kind of flipped the script there and bringing up a lot of these young guys. But if we have a good system, have a good coach, it shouldn't matter if they're young. I feel like we should be able to come in and make some noise in the playoffs, no matter what. But yeah. I digress. Um, yeah, it was a frustrating, frustrating year for the Preds. But, uh, hey, I think uh, we're going to be back on top soon. Yeah. Well, we're running a little long deal. Is there anything real quick you all want to touch on before we uh, kick it up? I know playoffs are going on in the NBA and everything, but. Yeah. Golden State's just dominating. Dallas State's sucks. Looking good. Doncic has no help. Um and they need to they need to get a rim protector so badly. Yeah, That's and then I, I think maybe uh, maybe we try to get Shump on here next week or yeah, maybe the I'll, week uh, after. Talk I'll a little text Shump baseball. this week because as college baseball is heating up here, uh, we'll definitely have to get him to, to come talk about the number one team, unanimous number one team in the country, Tennessee Volunteers, led by Tony Vitello, and it, it, the villains of college baseball. I'm uh, I'm here for it. I, I love the uh, the role that we're on and kind of the mentality that we've taken this season. Hey, it's Tennessee versus everybody. Uh, that's what I'm saying. And uh, SEC tourney starts this weekend, right? Yeah. All right. Starts Wednesday. Okay. Cool. Good deal. Good deal. Uh, we're all, so there's a single elimination round Wednesday, and then it starts like a double elimination maybe Thursday or something. Maybe it might even start Tuesday for single elimination. And then you got to just get into the double elimination tournament, mm -hmm. but top four are already in it. So top four, Tennessee, A&M, Arkansas, for Arkansas has taken a lot of like the fans are just outraged, but we literally finished third in the sec. Like most teams, most years will be like pretty pumped. Yeah. Um, and you know, third in the sec, literally Mississippi state won the national championship finished like fourth or fifth in the sec last year. It's possible. Just got to get playing the best at the right time. Yeah. Baseball is weird to too. Hot. Cause you don't even have to be great. You just got to win games and you got to find a way hot. to put yeah. a few more runs across than the other team. And so if you just kind of get that mojo, right, we'll see what happens, but postseason time. Now it's time to sack up. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks again for listening. This has been Patriot Sports, part of the Six Pack Coverage Network. Be sure to check them out at sixpackcoverage.com on socials, Instagram, Twitter, at Six Pack Coverage. Check us out on Twitter at Pater underscore sports, Instagram at Patriot Sports, website, patriotsports.blog. Guys, thanks again for listening. We'll see you all next week. Patriot out.